Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we're about to get started. And the first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a, a scheduling announcement that is, is on our website, on our press release and our meeting schedule, but this evening we'll be meeting with the primary care advisory group starting at 5 p.m. and that is via Teams and all of the sign-in information is there. And then um, the ongoing public comment, I will just re remark on it again, um, for anyone who wants to provide public comment on a potential next agreement with the state of Vermont and CMMI or CMS, um, please share your comments with um, the board and uh, there's a portal on our public comment section. Uh, we will share those comments with uh, both AHS and the governor's office as they are taking the lead on the negotiations for a potential next agreement. And that is an ongoing comment. Uh, we don't have any other public comments at this time. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. And I just wanna remind everybody that um, the Green Mountain Care Board is has made a decision to disable the chat function um, just so that there's no uh, distractions and no inappropriate use. Um, after each presentation, we always call for public comment or questions. And the way to do that is to raise your hand or to speak up. And um, with that, um, we're gonna move to the minutes of Wednesday, May 12th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Maureen and seconded by Tom to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 12, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motions were passed unanimously. Uh, the next item on the agenda is we're going to have an interesting presentation from Support and Services at Home, the SASH program, and I'm going to turn it over to Kim Fitzgerald and Melissa Southwick. Kim, Melissa, welcome. Great. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much. We're so excited to be here today and appreciate you uh, having us here. I'm Kim Fitzgerald. I'm the CEO for Cathedral Square. And I've been with Cathedral Square about 20 years going, oh, actually over 20 years now. And I am joined today um, by Melissa Southwick, who is our new SASH director. Melissa has been with Cathedral Square and SASH for the past six years, but stepped into the director role this past January. So I should add that Molly Dugan is still with us, just in a different role. So um, that's why you have the two of us here today. Um, so our goal for today is to give you a quick overview of the foundations of SASH, an update on SASH in Vermont currently, an overview of our funding through the years, challenges in funding as we move forward, some current results we have, and a wish for expansion. So I know that some of you have heard us present before and others have not. So we figured in order to level set in a, in a really quick, hopefully efficient way, we wanted to start out with a little quick video that we have. It's actually less than two minutes, giving kind of the overall um, foundations of SASH. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to be able to show you that video. I'll go ahead and start it. I should ask if you can all hear that. I don't think we have sound. Not hear it. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah. I'm sorry. I'll try that again. It's not giving me. Is there a button on the bottom, Kim? I thought I saw. Yeah, I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Let me just pull you back up. There it is. Yep. Healthcare spending is growing at an unsustainable rate, while the health outcomes are, at best, stagnant. 
The SASH model takes an intuitive approach at improving care and slowing the growth in healthcare spending. SASH is a coordinated partnership of nonprofits, including affordable housing, home health, agencies on aging, community mental health centers, and the SASH participant working together to keep each participant healthy and at home longer. This model puts participants and their families in the driver's seat. They set goals around their health with the support of their local SASH team. This collaboration simplifies life by providing transition support from hospital to home, self-management skills for better health, and person-centered care coordination. Costs for eligible adults are covered by a Medicare demonstration, grants, and partner housing agencies. Funding supports a SASH housing-based care coordinator and wellness nurse, creating incredible efficiencies and improved effectiveness. SASH operates out of 22 nonprofit housing organizations throughout Vermont, improving the lives of 5,000 participants and their families. The model's proven successes include reduced falls in hypertension, increased rates of immunizations, reduced Medicare expenses, and a 40% increase in advanced directives, saving millions of dollars per year. Not only are participants happier, healthier, and living longer lives, by taking a population health approach, the SASH partnership also boosts the entire community's health and well-being. For more information, visit All right, and so now we'll move to um, share a PowerPoint um, with some more information. So for background, Cathedral Square was created as created SASH in 2009 with help from residents and local service agencies. And we had some really great initial success with our first community, which was Heinenberg. And so we added to we were added to the Blueprint for Health in 2011. We quickly expanded statewide in every county of the state with almost 5,000 participants in 140 housing locations and 68 partner agencies. So yes, it's hard to believe, but 2021 marks our 10th anniversary of SASH services in Vermont. Since inception, we have served over 9,000 participants throughout the 10 years throughout Vermont. And in addition, we have just started our fifth year of SASH in Rhode Island and our third year in Minnesota. We are also currently working with Baltimore, Maryland and potentially California. We have been rigorously evaluated over five years by RTI, who published four evaluation reports on SASH with the final one coming out in July of 2019. The US Department of Health and Human Services and HUD contracted for this multi-year evaluation and each year, SASH was shown to reduce the growth of Medicare expenditures as compared to other Vermont residents living in similar situations, controlling for similar health conditions and age, all based on claim status, with the only difference being SASH. The evaluations focused on Medicare, because that was our funding source, and the final uh, report released in 2019 did take a look at Medicaid at our request and found that SASH was also reducing the growth in Medicaid expenditures as well. We are currently working with UVM um, and hope to secure funding for another valuation in the not too distant future. So we're working on that now. Our demographics have remained pretty consistent through the years with our ages ranging from 22 to 104 with the average age of 73. Although the majority of our participants are Medicare, again, you know, based on the funding, we do have young disabled with 25% of our participants being duals, and especially for, um, those living in public housing settings. Our top three chronic conditions are hypertension, arthritis, and chronic pain, which probably don't come as a surprise to any of you, uh, but we do see the full spectrum of conditions. What many don't realize is that our participants have a high rate of chronic conditions with a median of six per person. Three or more is considered high risk, 
and we have 75% of our participants with three or more chronic conditions. Statistically, those with lower incomes tend to have higher levels of chronic conditions, and we definitely see that play out with our participants. Our funding through the years, so in our initial years, Cathedral Square provided um, the startup funding for our pilot, and we did get some foundation funding as well as a legislative uh, appropriation. And then again, due to the success, by 2011, we were added to the Blueprint for Health and started receiving funding through MAPCP, which probably many of you know, but for, for everybody, it's the Multi-Payer Advanced Primary Care Practice, the CMS uh, Medicare demonstration. Our original request for funding was to support 62 panels or around 6,000 people, but that was decreased to 54 panels uh, due to funding across the state. And we served 70, about 70 to 100 people per panel. At that time, our budget was $70,000 um, per panel. The MAPCP funding covered direct services only, so the wellness nurse and SASH coordinator time on site only. Dale covers the programming, training, uh, partner, agency support, regional support, and statewide administration. DIVA has covered funding for the management of the SASH data, and we've worked with Vermont Department of Health, VDH, on very specific programming initiatives. Housing organizations uh, have funded the, the GAP and found different grants to help support them in doing so. Our funding did not increase at all during the first seven years. In fact, we actually had a 2% reduction uh, due to the federal sequestration. So housing organizations have had to cover more and more through the years as costs have risen. By 2017, the five-year demonstration ended and the blueprint was added to the all-payer model. In that first year, we continued to receive our direct service uh, funding directly through the blueprint, but by 2018, we have a direct contract with OneCare, and now we receive our funding directly through OneCare. 2018 was the first year we actually received a 3.5% increase. In 2019, we received a 2.5% increase plus a 1% increase for lead care coordination through OneCare. We received no increase in 2020, and in 2021, we received a small uh, one-time increase, uh, which we're so appreciative of the Green Mountain Care Board staff for recommending and for you for approving, um, but it was directed to be used in high-risk areas, not statewide, and was only for one year. So we had eliminated our options. Um, but we did choose to add supportive staff positions to help transition our trainings to be virtual, something we've learned through COVID, and to support staff absences around the state so there is no lapse in services. So our funding challenges, uh, you know, we do worry about our future funding. Uh, the DIVA HIT funding ends this June 30th, so that's 205000 um, that we will not have, and we have no replacement for that funding, you know, at this time. Our Dale funding totals 974000 and is set to be reduced by 541000 as of July 1st of 2022 due to legislative language stating it should transition to OneCare. Yet OneCare says they do not have the funds to cover this. So we have no resolution, um, and this funding would actually need to be in OneCare's 2022 budget based on the different fiscal years. Although the legislation gave us three years you know, to work through and make this transition, um, I've been meeting regularly with Ina Backus, um, Susan's been joining us, as well as Vicki Loader separately, um, but we don't have a solution yet. And lastly, of course, we're unsure about the future of the all pair model and really the correct placement for SASH within um, healthcare reform in the state of Vermont. So I, that's my part, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa. So Chair Mullen, I, I would leave it to you if you wanna stop there to ask any questions or if we should wait until the end of the presentation. I think we'll wait till the end if that's okay. That is great, and then I will turn it over to Melissa. Great, thank you so much, Kim. So I wanted to start off just by sharing with you our experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it was quite a shift to bring our largely in-person program to one that could be offered remotely. 
We did this through enhanced staff support. Since March of 2020, our SASH admin team has hosted over 30 hour long trainings for SASH staff on COVID specific topics. These trainings provided up to the minute information on the pandemic, how sp SASH specifically was impacted, guidance to keep staff and participants safe, and a chance for peer learning. The SASH admin team developed a phased in approach for SASH staff to follow based on positive cases in their building and communities. Cathedral Square's emergency response team led the way in planning for the impact this pandemic would have on congregate housing, and we were able to share that information and guidance with all of our SASH sites. Participant education and support. SASH staff offered new options to participants to share information on the pandemic, including increasing their newsletters, posting and sharing flyers, as well as offering group phone meetings and um, additional mailings. SASH staff were able to utilize their close working relationships with SASH participants to make sure each individual participant was receiving information in the best way possible for them to receive it. SASH staff also completed individual COVID-19 plans with participants, helping them plan for how to get their needs met during lockdown and preparing for support and resources that may be needed should they become ill. Vaccines. Through the federal pharmacy program, we were able to host on-site clinics across many SASH sites with great reception, averaging over 85% of residents getting vaccinated at those clinics. Where clinics could not be offered or for those SASH participants living in the community, staff assisted with scheduling vaccination appointments and arranging for transportation. Increased connections through technology um, has been a big focus for the SASH staff over the past year, as I'm sure you can imagine. At the end of 2020, we received 270 iPads from state COVID relief funds provided to VPQHC, the Vermont Program for Quality and Healthcare to create lending libraries at all SASH sites across the state. Each SASH site received tablets, um, several tablets to loan out to participants. These can be used for telehealth appointments, remote mental health appointments, SASH programs, and socialization with family and friends. Our SASH wellness nurses have been able to assist with telehealth appointments in many ways, including providing technology support, sharing vitals with the provider in real time, and we even have some nurses piloting point of care A1C testing right now. During the pandemic, many SASH programs were offered remotely with great success. We had a very popular bone builders program in Lamoille County, for example, that doubled in size when it switched to a remote program. Learning from that experience, we're currently using the additional One Care funding for 2021 that Kim mentioned to convert other SASH programs to ones that can be done in a hybrid model in person with a remote option for when that's preferred. With funding from One Care Vermont and Howard, as well as in-kind donations from Cathedral I've Square, never done that. we are now in our fourth year of the pilot embedding a mental health clinician at SASH sites. The Embedded Mental Health Clinician provides support and discussion groups, education groups, and one-on-one -on -one counseling. She's supporting individuals as well as the building as a whole, reducing stigma and increasing awareness and empathy. She's supporting previously homeless individuals and is also helping with housing retention efforts. In both sites, we have seen a steady reduction in ED presentations since the Embedded Mental Health pilot began. The SASH staff and participants at each site are very pleased with the program, as you can see from these quotes that were obtained in our end of year program survey conducted in December of 2020. SASH works with participants in a variety of ways to lower blood pressure, including hosting regular blood pressure clinics, loaning blood pressure cuffs, one-on-one -on -one and group education classes on hypertension management and prevention, as well as communicating with PCPs. There have been 3,610 SASH participants that have had a stage two blood pressure reading. Among those participants, we've seen a decrease of 16.1 millimeters of mercury in systolic readings. And for the 2,063 SASH participants that have had a stage one reading, we've seen an average reduction of 5.23 millimeters of mercury in systolic readings. This is enough to, of a decrease to bring both of these levels into an elevated or managed range. We looked at all of our SASH participants that were active in both 2018 and 2019, and then we filtered out for high ED utilization as defined by four or more visits per year. We had 325 people that met these criteria. 
In 2018, these 325 individuals accounted for 2,221 ER visits. In 2019, these same 325 people accounted for 1,320 ER visits or 901 fewer visits. This is a median decline of three visits per year. It's estimated that the average cost of a basic mid-level ER visit is $843. So this reduction in visits could amount to over $750,000 in healthcare costs saved. We also saw a median reduction of three ER visits between 2019 and 2020, but we didn't include that figure due to the potential impact the COVID-19 pandemic may have had on the numbers during that time frame. As we mentioned, we've been capped at 54 panels or roughly 5,000 people for the last 10 years. We have growing wait lists in all of our DRO regions across the state, and we have no additional funding for services when the new age-specific housing opens up. We'd like 10 more panels across the state. Our mental health pilot is so successful, we would love to expand this to at least two mental health clinicians at each of the six DRO regions across the state, especially given the impact COVID-19 has had on mental health. SASH and Family Housing, or SASH for All, most of our housing partners have general occupancy housing or family housing and have been asking for years for a SASH type model to be brought to those low income housing locations. We've tried to secure funding for a pilot, but we've been unsuccessful so far. Although it may involve different partners at the table, we believe we can still have a major impact on immunization rates, health screenings, ER visits, as well as eviction, hunger, and stability. Thank you all so much for letting us talk with you today about SASH, and I think we're ready to open it up for questions. Super, thank you very much. I'm gonna open it up to the board first. Board members, questions or comments for Kim or Melissa? Uh, yeah, first, thank you very much for the presentation um, and you know, a lot of good work that's being done out there. Just a question, I, I don't think I heard, how, what is your total funding? Did you give us a number on what your total funding is? I know it stayed pretty stagnant, but. It, it's just over $5 million. Okay. And when you combine everything together. Right, right, right. And I mean, because it seems like when you obviously show like the reduction in ER visits and things like that, you know, some of these cost benefits. So hopefully that will help you be able to get more panels and get more funding, but. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's you know hard hard to do that, but it, it's good to be able to see numbers when you're talking about this. But um, great, thank you very much. Yeah, my uh, first question was along the lines of uh, of of Marines and uh, and just wondering that you know if across 350 of your participants you can document that you saved seven hundred and sixty thousand dollars, do you? Uh, have uh, a kind of uh, micro accounting as to, you know, which of those hospitals uh, those folks might be associated with so that you can on a very tactical approach say, hey, hospital, we're saving you this money. We've documented it. You can't challenge our data, assuming it can't be challenged. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, maybe with emergency room visits and maybe with high blood pressure because you know, you do know who your 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 a patient client base is, that you can be, um, begin to develop contracts that are uh, pay for performance. Yeah, I would absolutely say that we can um, get right down to the town of where those people live. So that is definitely something that we could begin to explore. All right. So those those three hundred and fifty three hundred twenty five people that were in your emergency room, Pat, those are the same people in 2018 and 2019? Yes, and that's why we filtered for people that were current in both years that were with us for the whole time of both years so that we could do a year-by-year -year comparison. Uh -huh. Well, it sounds like there might be an opportunity there. I mean, if, if you can show these hospitals that you're sav they're saving money in their budget, um, there's got to be a way to uh, uh, um, leverage that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> another question I had was, as you see, because you are Medicare based, you probably don't have a lot of relationships of relationships with people that are pre medic me Medicare. I'm sorry, Medicare based, pre Medicare. And I'm just wondering if you have any insights into benefit packages in insurance plans 
that would that are not there now, and you know that from being out there on the ground, you know, um, um, with, with with folks that are transitioning to Medicare, whether there are benefit plans in the insurance that they now have, um, that would would um, mean that you would be um, receiving people that are already kind of you know in your modality of of, of treatment rather than having this kind of sharp break at, at say 65. Um, so maybe suggestions like in the benchmark plan, you know, which I know is going to be going under a review um, for the large group and QHP populations, uh, are, you know, are there um, things that you could advise those folks that they should look at as in terms of rearrangement of benefits to, uh, you know, to, to help people transition in, in, into your programs? All a great, all a great suggestions. I will say that we are currently talking um, with one of the local providers um, about their Medicare Advantage plan and whether we could offer SASH services under that. So not exactly what you're getting at, but I understand uh, your thinking. And also, our SASH for, for all would actually open that up um, for folks of all ages. And because when we first started out, we were based out of congregate housing settings, um, not everybody who lives in the congregate housing settings are 55 or older or 65 and older, 62, depending on which, which category you're looking at. Um, and so we do have younger participants as well, mostly, of course, disabled um, that we already are, are working with and working with their the service needs that they have. Thank you. And I also oh. just, could, if I could go back to your first question, I'm sorry, I should, uh, about the hospital piece, about going out, you know, to the hospitals. I do think one of the dynamics that's at play right now is the fact that we're receiving the money through OneCare as part of their prepaid advance shared savings. And so I do think that many hospitals are believing that they are pretty much funding SASH right now, even though I know that when the all pair model was negotiated and the blueprint SASH funding was kind of layered onto that. That wasn't the intention initially, but that is believed by some at this point. Is is that believed or is that the reality? I would probably have to defer to uh, probably Ina Bacchus to answer that question. Um, but yeah, again, that my understanding through her was that that was not the intention, um, but because the savings have not, we haven't reached the exact um, benchmarking that was set out in the original kind of performa that, that I think there is, yes, that I think they are paying um, because the savings isn't there that they thought they were going to have. Thank you. Okay, other board members? I guess I would just chime in on that point. The piece of that that people miss is that the benchmark would be $8 million less but for the fact that that money is in there. So I know people look at it in different ways based on where they sit, but the benchmark would actually be less if the SASH money and, and the blueprint money weren't in there. Um, but thank you, Kim, and um, for coming in today and getting an update. It's always good to hear about how the program is evolving and, and what's going on. I was a little bit curious about um, whether there are any lessons from Rhode Island that you're seeing that could translate to Vermont. Um, just, I imagine there's potentially some lessons learned that could go back and forth between the two states or uh, funding ideas or something like that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And one I actually haven't thought a lot about. I would say Rhode Island is, is much smaller. So I feel like they're learning from us. I think Minnesota is where the difference is because they are the organizations we're working with there are managed care organizations. So as uh, Vermont is thinking more that direction um, from what I've been recently hearing, um, that we may be able to learn more from um, Maryland, uh, uh, also Baltimore, Maryland, but also from uh, Minnesota currently, and then uh, Baltimore, Maryland that we're working with. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Melissa and Kim. It was great to hear from you um, and learn more about your program. Uh, I had the same question about Rhode Island, so I'll skip that, but I wondered if funding did expand, how would you prioritize the needs across the state, either programmatically or geographically? Where would you park those extra dollars? Where is the greatest need that's unmet as of now? Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's that that is a struggle, right? Because we have a lot of wants. Um, and so I think the first thing is um, the per panel fee, we just got to get up a little bit. And just just for some background, that original budget for 70,000 for panel was for nursing at $35 an hour. And pretty much almost out of the gate of us getting funded, you know, our nursing contracts across the state are ranging anywhere from, you know, high $40 an hour to $55 an hour. So right there, we have a, a huge gap in that kind of original budgeting. So we really do have to, if we're not going to get an increase every year for the panels across the board, we do have to give some funding to that because I worry we're going to reach a point where housing providers are going to say they can't, they just can't do it any longer. They can't help supplement it. They can't find the extra sources that they've had to go out um, and secure. So that's one area. Um, the second one I'd have to say is really we, we'd like 10 new New panels um, and so that would probably be the second priority because we do have wait lists in area and we have um, areas that have just been waiting um, to you know to get a sash panel every year we try to add more uh, affordable housing in the state and that those housing um, communities have not been able to offer sash and so that would probably be you know the next priority i would say and then followed by um you know probably at this point it would be like the mental health expansion that we've just seen such remarkable results that we just believe and 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 honestly on the heels of covid we just feel like it's now is the time um and then i guess from that would be um the sash for all um you know and again that's that's mainly just because that's a, a newer initiative but we also see it could have huge, you know, huge, huge savings. And and I didn't say this, I don't think, during the presentation. I have probably in previous presentations. But, you know, based on what the evaluators told us, we are the only program they had evaluated that actually showed a reduction in Medicare expenditures. And they haven't seen that. They're lucky if they see it break even, let alone kind of bend the cost curve. Um, so we'd love to be able to do more. Just as a quick follow-up, geographically, where are the wait lists the longest? Oh, I'll defer to Melissa on that. Um, yeah, I can absolutely answer that. So we, um, as I think you might imagine, just the uh, populations, right? So uh, Chittenden County has some wait lists, Rutland has some wait lists, but also there's places that are underserved right now, like the middle of Orange County. We have um, services on both, both sides of Orange County, but nothing in the middle. So there's a Bellows Falls area, Tunbridge area, that's really just been clamoring for a panel for years. Um, and then also Brattleboro has had some wait lists lately as well. Great, thank you. I always considered Bells Falls to be Wyndham County. Okay, yep. You know what? It's really interesting because there's that area where it's kind of like nobody's able to serve them, and so who is the closest? <laughs> and I think for our purposes, Orange was always the closest, but yes, I think you're right. It is Wyndham County. <laughs> okay. At this point, we're going to open it up to the public for any comments or questions. Members of the public? Not seeing anyone, um, so I, I want to thank you both for a, a great presentation. And uh, I know that uh, the people in Washington are very familiar with the cost uh, savings that you have achieved, and uh, they would like to uh, see that replicated elsewhere across the country. So um, keep up doing the good work. Thank you so very much, and thank you all for your time. Thank you. Sure. At this point, we're going to move to a discussion on fiscal year 21 hospital provider transfers. And I'm gonna turn it over to Russ McCracken, Patrick Rooney, and Lori Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? We can. All right, let me know when you can see the presentation on the screen, please. We can. All right, super, we'll get started. All right, as the chair described, we have a Topic for consideration today, a little bit of house cleaning regarding a couple of provider transfers. <clears throat> so just a quick recap here of this process. Uh, at any point during the year, a hospital may request changes to its approved budget. 
the board does expect to be uh, reasonably informed of any of these changes. Uh, any of those changes occurring prior to May 1, that being October 1, the beginning of the fiscal year through May 1 are expected to occur during the current fiscal year. Any changes after that are expected to occur in the jo July 1st budget submission. <clears throat> and this includes changes resulting from provider transfers. For independent providers, a letter of intent and documents to the Greenmount Care Board regarding a revised budget shall be filed within 30 days prior to the transfers and other reporting requirements. A notice to patients shall be sent, and Greenmount Care Board does not approve these transfers. We track and acknowledge the resulting changes to the hospital budget uh, and ensure that the patients receive the adequate notice. For budget adjustments, the Greenmount Care Board staff will review within 15 days after receiving a completed request and make recommendations to the board. Regarding the provider transfers, the board tracks existing healthcare dollars in and out of state hospital. These are not new dollars per se to the healthcare system, but they do impact a hospital's budget. This policy does not require board approval of the provider transfer or acquisition. This goes for independent providers that move into a hospital in which the patients are to be given notice or hospital provider practices that separate from the hospital. This situation is a little bit more unique. It's a provider practice um, that has been billing under the tax ID number of the UVM Medical Center, and that information is being shifted to Central Vermont Medical Center where the practice physically exists. So the time frame here for this has been that we received an email, the staff of Green Mountain Care Board that is, in February of 2021 with the provider transfers and appropriate schedules. We send a communication uh, to Central Vermont and UVM to confirm that these transfers also affected the UVM Medical Center for documentation purposes, and we received confirmation and supporting schedules from UVMMC in April. During the duration, <clears throat> we spoke uh, as a team with our legal counsel. As this, as I said, this is a little bit different as far as uh, provider transfers considered because it's going um, inter-network, that is the inter-UVM uh, health network <clears throat> situation. And the reasons for this change um, were that at the end of fiscal year 20, they did transfer the, the three practices, general surgery, family, pra family medicine, and ear, nose, and throat. These are not reflected in the fiscal year 20 or 21 budgets in that these three practices exist in the UVM Medical Center's budget for those years. They do not exist in Central Vermont's budget for those years. These changes needed to occur prior to the end of fiscal year 20, and they did. They occurred in the last week of fiscal year 20, ending on 930. And the reason for this was that they wanted to ensure a continuation of being able to provide 340B drug benefits to the patients of those practices, should they be part of that program. Uh, any gap in that um, could have caused an interruption in the possibility for those benefits for patients who are parts of those practices. As stated before, the providers located at Central Vermont already. There's no change to the physical practice location. It exists there. It's just being, has historically been billed under the tax ID of UVM Medical Center. And as the health network con continues to consolidate um, some of the practices and, and business operations under that network, these types of uh, actions will, will happen from time to time. Here is the financial breakdown uh, for Central Vermont and UVM. Central Vermont will be uh, gaining about 4.5 million in NPR and about 5.5 million in expenses and an operating loss of just over a million dollars. And UVM will be shedding the same amount of revenue and expenses and, and also the operating loss that once existed with these three practices under UVM's budget finances. So our recommendation here is that we require UVM and Central Vermont to reflect these changes in their FY21 budgets when they submit it, when they submit their FY22 budgets, so that when we're looking at a budget to budget uh, perspective, that this would be, that change would be reflected in that so that neither organization um, is being misrepresented from a financial perspective based on the fact that these transfers have already occurred. And <clears throat> this approach treats the transfers as if they were changes that occurred prior to May 1 under the budget and amendments adjustment policy. And there's a link here for anyone who wants to access that. We recommend this uh, approach instead of asking the hospitals to request a formal uh, amendment to their FY21 budget because of the pandemic having skewed actual performances 
Um, both hospitals are missing their revenue and operating expense targets uh, in, a, in a pretty significant way. Um, so they're coming in below what they had anticipated year to date. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, uh, the board has decided not to take enforcement action for, with respect to FY21 budgets. And in our view, based on where we are in the budget cycle, we're about five weeks away from uh, submissions at this point. Most effective use of time and resources is to have a correct FY21 budget baseline for fiscal year 22 budget submission. So that documentation should be updated prior to that FY21 or FY22 submission. So we open it up to board comments and discussions, and we also have uh, some motion language here for you to acknowledge these transfers. And uh, should there be any questions that I cannot answer, Lori Perry and Russ McCracken are both on the line. Turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Patrick. And uh, it's my understanding that uh, these practices, its this is really what I would call a mysterious paper shuffle because they've been at Central Vermont. They'll continue to be at Central Vermont. We're not... Uh, adding any dollars to the system or subtracting any dollars to the system. It's just the way that they're accounted for. And um, really the backstory was that there was some concern um, from some of these providers um, when they first wanted to do this a few years ago about uh, the affiliation with the um, UVM teaching faculty. And so um, I think that uh, this is something that totally makes sense to happen and uh you know because you're going to be leaving federal dollars on the table with the 340b pricing and again i think that uh, what you're suggesting in your motion language makes an incredible amount of sense too because it's not like we're, we're approving or disapproving it's just how we're treating it in terms of how we're viewing the hospital budgets and uh you know this properly belongs at Central Vermont Medical Center. So with that, I'll open it up to the, the board for questions or comments. Yeah, I just have one. I mean, it makes sense um, for the 22 budgets, you know, to be comparing the 21 and the 22 with it in the, in the what would be the correct place. I guess for, I know we're not doing enforcement for 21, um, but I would just suggest when they come in with 21, uh, are you assuming then they don't make that change to the 21 budget and it's their original budget and then they'll just have a variance which they can explain or how are you thinking that the submission would come in there? I believe we, what we've asked them to do is to make an alteration to those FY21 budget numbers as if the practices were already there. <clears throat> okay, so when they come in for their 21 actuals, they will, it will, they'll have a new budget, if you will, for 21. They'll be adjusted in that budget that they'll compare okay. it against. Correct. Okay, so we have to change that in our systems and things like that as well, which we can do, but you'll have to change you know, any of the reports that we see for 21, um, ha having the budget change, correct? Because it's already loaded into our systems the other way. Lori, can you answer this, please? Perhaps I have it wrong. I'm, I'm not sure I'm hearing Maureen correctly. Sure. Um, anytime that we've had these type of provider transfers and it's in the middle of the budget process, like going into um, when we demonstrate these to you when they present their 22, we will show you previous 21 budget, these provider transfers, and then so you get a new base for 21 to take their 22 growth against. Does that make sense? We yeah, that, so that makes sense for the 22, and then for 21 when we get their 21 stuff coming in, are you gonna do the same thing? We most likely will, but also you're not doing enforcement on 21 anyways. No, I know we're not doing enforcement, but I still like to see what the changes are <laughs> against a relative base, but we, we can deal with that at, at the be, time of 21. Asking those type of questions when it comes in, correct. Okay. 
Okay. Thanks. Other members of the board? I would just say this seems like a reasonable approach and I support the motion language. Same here. I, uh, you know, the, the way I'm, I'm hearing this is that basically there would be a little retroactive adjustments in the 21 and 20 and the 2021 21 budget to reflect in adaptive uh, what was really happening on the ground. And um, it's, it's, it's an adjustment that needs to be made for, in order to move forward to 2022. I agree with what everyone said. Okay. Um, Robin, would you like to make a motion and then I'll open it up for public comment? Sure. Um, I move that we acknowledge the provider transfers from UVM Medical Center to CVMC, which were effective at the end of fiscal year 2020 and not reflected in those hospitals approved fiscal year 21 budget. Also that we instruct UVMMC and CVMC to include appropriate adjustments to their <clears throat> fiscal year 21 budgets to reflect the provider transfers when they submit their fiscal year 22 budgets in order to establish a, an adjusted fiscal year 21 baseline budget. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Tom. So at this point, I'm gonna open it up to the public for any public comment or discussion. Members of the public? Uh, yes, Dale. So I joined a little late and this question may have already been answered, but what concerns me on transfers like this and what I'm struggling to understand is things like Billing, like I remember I got some bills from CVH and I called them up to pay it and they were like, oh, that's already been paid. It's that Medicaid paid late. And I was like, wait, you billed me because Medicaid paid late? Um, so does this change the billing for the consumer? Does it? If they've got a higher debt ratio, does, does it change that whole policy? Does this change the staffing workforce in terms of who's available? Um, does CVH have the right to reduce staff? They need to keep the staff as is. Does it affect transfers as far as recommendations? If you need um, a specialist, does it change how do they still send you to Burlington? Or are they, as a priority, going to send you in-house? Which, I'm not calling that bad. I'm just saying, is it an adverse effect? I mean, how, how so does... Dale, as I understand that um, the patient will be unaffected, and somebody can correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but the, the way it's been explained to me is that the patients will not be affected at all. And this is merely being done to reflect the ability to access additional 340B prescription drug dollars. And that in reality, these have always been Central Vermont doctors. They were located there. They were not located at, at the Burlington site. And so it just makes sense from all perspectives to, uh, you know, get this where they actually physically are and to access those additional 340B dollars. And please, anybody correct me if I've got any of that wrong. And I hear a correction, so that must be the right answer. So thank you for the clarification. Thank you for the question, Dale. Very, very important one because Nobody wants the consumer to be affected by this. Is there any other public comment? Hearing none, I'm going to shift the, the motion back to the board. Is there any further discussion by the board?
Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion language as outlined in the slide um, in front of you on your screens, um, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Let the record show the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Patrick and team. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At this point, we're gonna to move to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Maureen and seconded by Jess to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of this incredibly beautiful day.